Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Keith Silva, in for Judy Simpson. The first sawmill in Vermont started spinning in about 1738 in the town of Westminster. Since then, Vermonters have built a rich culture and tradition of logging and forestry. Today's logger isn't far removed from those early pioneers. Chainsaws have replaced axes and machinery has taken the place of animals, but being profitable remains the top priority to make a living off the land. To keep today's forest professionals in business, UVM Extension has expanded its farm viability program to include loggers, foresters, and woodworkers. I went to Springfield earlier this year to meet with a logger who was doing what loggers do best. If a tree falls in the forest and John Parker is around, you can bet it makes a sound. Over the winter, Parker has been working with a landowner in Springfield to thin out pine, remove Norway maple, and cut about 50 cords of firewood. No guts, no glory, right? Parker runs Brookside Timber Harvesting. In fact, he is Brookside Timber Harvesting. To his fellow loggers, he's what's considered a small operator. So what's a small operator? I don't know, it's one guy at a chainsaw, skitter. <laughs> For 25 years, Parker has been working in the woods. He logs, sugars, runs a portable sawmill, and he works with a forester to remove invasive species. He's been thinking about expanding his logging operation. He'd like to buy more equipment and hire someone to help him out. But Parker knows he has limitations. Oh, I'm a good logger, but I'm not a good business when it comes to doing paperwork. I don't like paperwork, um, really didn't know where to start. I could have maybe fumbled through some stuff on the internet, but it doesn't take much for me to get sidetracked. Parker has an accountant. What he needed was a business plan. To help him get his business on track, he contacted Chris Lindgren, a University of Vermont Extension forest business educator. John Smart, the fact that John knew he wasn't good at the paperwork, he had someone helping him do that part, uh, made it easier to sort of assess the financial position that he was in. Um, and that was a small part of the business planning process, actually. You know, the way I work with most folks is I've got a bunch of exercises um, that we go through, one-page plans, goal setting, uh, write up a history of business, and through small chunks, we basically put a business plan together. Chris kind of made it easy. He worked with me and gave me little projects to complete, which worked well for me. Just little little tasks, not just dump the whole thing on me and yeah, kind of worked at my pace. Saw. Working together, Lindgren and Parker that's, set that's some goals. One of the first things that I try to do with folks is to um, do some goal setting. And, and his, his first three goals, one was to write a business plan to get financing for a piece of equipment. The other was to get licensed in um, chemical application for invasive species. Another was to work on marketing um, and build out a website. Business plans are living documents, and like life, they can change. The equipment Parker had his eye on was a feller puncher, a combination chainsaw and excavator for pulling and hauling logs. But when Parker's license to remove invasive species came through, he had to make a business decision. Forestry is always a moving target, and when we started, the puncher looked like the way to go and this other avenue opened up, so the buncher is kind of still in the works, but it's not as much a priority as it was when Chris and I first started. Is that okay? I think it's okay. I mean, it's you've got to work in the woods. It's just like farming or any, you've got to make hay when the sun shines, and um, this seems to be working out and paying well. Um, not sure, you know, the buncher would work. It's just this seems to be a, a good avenue for the short term. I think to be a small operator and to move forward, you're going to have to be diverse and be able to be flexible. And this just kind of wasn't where I planned to be, but it seems to work out. And I think the buncher and that type operation is inevitably where I'm headed. But instead of being a, a month or a year, it may be a couple of years to get this avenue taken care of before we put the buncher into the plan. One of the reasons I like to work using one-page plans or using exercises, it, it allows it to change, it allows you to, um, to continuously work on your plan. Oftentimes people do just write a business plan to get financing and then that's it, they shelve it. Much better to continue working with your plan, updating your plan, changing your plan, um, facts on the ground change, and then you've got to change with them. If it wasn't for Chris helping me out, I wouldn't do it. 
I just I would just keep muddling along like I had been and find money if I wanted something and jockey stuff around and if it hadn't been for him helping me no I, I probably wouldn't even mess around with it. There's a saying, love what you do and you'll never work a day in your life. It's advice Parker lives by. There's a lot of easier ways to make a living. <laughs> um, I think I know where this is going. Why do I do this? Um, I guess I, do, I love it. You have to love to be a logger. I like being outdoors. I like setting my own destiny. I complain about it all the time and swear I'm never gonna do it again. And then I go right back to it. It's nice dealing with customers. Um, it's rewarding to see at the end of the day a, a big pile of wood. It's physical, challenging, dangerous work, but it's after a day or two you'll get used to it. A good logger knows when to cut and what to keep. A good businessman knows when to ask for help to achieve what he's got in mind. Thanks to UVM Extension's Forest Business Program, John Parker is both. Well, Chris Lindgren joins me in the studio now. Chris is a forest business educator. Chris, thanks for being on Across the Fence. Thanks for having me here, Keith. Give us a quick update on uh, John's operation since I was down there. Well, since then, uh, sugaring season has ended. John's got a small sugaring operation. Uh, he's made a couple hundred gallons. Uh, he's also got a sawmill. He's been sawing up some wood at his sawmill. And um, as far as our business planning, he's uh, tackled his final goal of setting up a marketing plan and he's working on a digital media strategy working with the uh, Vermont Small Business Development Corporation. That's awesome, that's great. Um, as we saw in the story, John is a small operator. You told me you also work with small sawmills, timber framers, woodworkers. Do those professions require different needs when it comes to writing a business plan? Well, it's yes and no. I mean, I use the same tools and the same process, whichever business I work with. Um, but each business is unique, so each business plan has to be unique. Um, we customize the business plan um, to the business individual needs. We spend time trying to figure out what that business's unique position is, mm -hmm. what their uh, strengths and weaknesses are, and then we build a plan around that to uh, you know, optimize their strengths, mitigate their weaknesses. There are differences among industries, mm -hmm. um, however. Logging is a capital intensive business, okay. which requires some different aspects to planning, um, say versus woodworking, which you still need some equipment, but not as much. Right. Woodworking, you would spend more time on marketing, mm -hmm. um, you plan. So there's different emphasis depending on which industry you're in. I think it's a good uh, thing to point out too, is that just you know a business plan is a business requires a business plan, but you're not giving people just some sort of uh, you know well here it is and you know here's the template fill it out. You're 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 tailoring each one to their individual needs. Yeah, we work together um, on each plan to figure out what goals they have and how we're going to reach them. Um, we talked about the different aspects in John's business, the sugaring, you mentioned the sawmill. Is that common in logging and forestry in Vermont that you would have different things that you would do besides just working in the woods? Yeah, the, um, there was a uh, report put out in 2014 called Characteristics of Successful and Innovating Logging Contractors in the Northeastern U.S. <laughs> Sexy title. Um, that's right. <laughs> um, it points that diversification as a key attribute to successful operators. Um, leveraging your business and industry synergies, such as, you know, cutting firewood and then mm -hmm. cut split delivered, um, can add value to customers as well as to a business's bottom line. We hear about uh, diversification a lot in agriculture, and with someone with the last name Silva, I would be in trouble if I didn't say that forestry is called Silva culture. Um, <laughs> is, is, is that diversification, it says that article seems to point out, that's the way that most forestry folks uh, make ends meet? Um, yeah, I mean, diversification is a key. You know, a lot of people who are in the logging industry will do excavating, um, they'll do sugaring, some foresters um, also do some logging on the side. So it is, it's an important part of um, having a business, not just make ends meet, but having a business that thrives. Thrives, um, right, the profitability uh, side of it. Um, I, I've yet to meet a farmer who will admit to me that they started farming to get rich. I suspect loggers are much the same way. Um, if someone what, wants to get into forestry, what kind of income should they expect to make? What are, what are the things that they should be thinking about? Well, that's a great question, Keith, and there's a lot of operating loggers that I'm sure would like an answer to it. <laughs> um, <laughs> We actually, at our logging workshops, we um, 
ask a question of loggers as to what return they should expect on mm -hmm. their investment um, in equipment. Um, and 99% of the time, the room is silent. <laughs> um, that said, it's a core question um, that I work with with all businesses. Um, we try to set income targets. And when working with John, we decided what he needed as an income in order to operate in his business. And that's where we start. It's one of the key financial metrics um, in the financial plan. Knowing how much money you've got to work with to start off so that you know how much you can uh, build into and what, what you can expect. It sounds like good business. Exactly. <laughs> it, you know, it's um, some back casting. Where do right. we want to end up? We want to end up with X amount of dollars a year. So how are we going to get there? Yeah. Um, UVM Extension's Forest Business Program partners with the Vermont Farm and Forest Viability Program. What's the significance of the connection between these two partners? Um, the Farm and Forest Viability Program um, is part of the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, the mm -hmm. VHCB. Mm -hmm. uh, VHCB, through the Farm and <coughs> excuse me, um, Forest Viability Program, does um, training and advocacy work uh, throughout the state and region. Um, the uh, Farm and Forest Viability Program has been partnering on the farm side with uh, UVM Extension for many years, mm -hmm. and in 2014, we decided to bring this successful model to uh, forest products businesses. Um, so it's, it's allowed a proven, tested model for reinforcing business viability um, to work with the businesses that work in the 85% of Vermont's working landscape, which is forested. Right. Um, one of the eligibility requirements for that program is two years of experience. What's your advice, before we talk a little bit more about that, what's your advice to someone starting out before they get that experience and they get to, they get to finally meet with Chris Lindgren? Well, the best, uh, <laughs> the best way to get experience is to go and get a job. Right. Um, whether um, you want to work volunteering with people you know who do it or get an actual job, um, that's the best way to get experience. If you're still in school, Vermont has uh, several tech high schools um, where you can you know, learn both hands-on and classroom learning. Mm. Um, there's a program at the Hazen School in Hardwick. The Bennington uh, Tech School has a program, as does the Hartford um, School. I'm sure there's others. Uh, at the college level, there's also educational opportunities um, if that's where you want to go. Um, so those are, you know, that, that's, that's the best way to sort of get started, whether you want to jump right into the woods working with someone or get some education first. Mm. Excellent. Uh, what kind of programs are there out there to learn to work in the woods safely, uh, a, a course or something like that? Well, all the programs I mentioned, of course, work on uh, you know, safety right. in the woods. <laughs> um, however, you know, beyond that, there's some programs that offer continuing education. Um, LEAP, which is the Loggers uh, Education to Advance Professionalism, offers regular training um, in all aspects of uh, you know, timber harvesting from felling to equipment um, to log bucking to first aid, uh, rescue. Um, is that something we actually, you know, sometimes we think about logging and we think, you know, we forget, we know it's dangerous, but we sort of forget about the danger aspect of it. But if anyone's out there thinking about, you know, obviously a career, that's a little bit different. But even for anyone who just, you know, has, uh, has, we, uh, has some trees in their backyard or some acres or whatever, safety first. And there's lots of programs to deal with safety in Vermont, correct? Yeah, and again, you don't have to be a professional logger. Um, at LEAP, they recommend that you take a course called the Game of Logging, which actually mm. teaches you how to safely um, fell trees. Um, the uh, Vermont Forest Products Association also does um, networking, education, and advocacy. Um, it's more of a professional group um, for loggers. When, we've got about two minutes left. When, you, uh, when you're working with someone or they, they come to you, you're looking for those two years of experience, uh, you mentioned it in the piece, but I think it's important. You really want to, you want them to show you something. So rather than bring you a, a shoebox with a bunch of, hey, you know, I've, I've had these clients and here's, a, you know, my financial records, you want to see something. That's really important when you go to start a business plan. Yeah, we do um, often end up with, you know, the proverbial shoebox, in which case then the first thing we'll start with is, you know, organizing finances. You know, most folks have done their taxes, and so we do have tax records we can look at. So mm -hmm. that's one place that you can start if you don't have, you know, your books in an accounting program. But we recommend that you get your uh, finances, you know, straightened out and you get your um, books in an accounting program. It allows for much easier financial analysis, mm -hmm. you know, up to date sort of recording of what's been done last week or last month rather right. than waiting to the end of the year and then looking at, you know, what went right or what didn't go right. Right. Just about 30 seconds left. Let people know how they can get in touch with you and find out more about UVM Extension's Forest Business Program. 
Well, I work out of um, the Rutland office, but you can um, reach us at the uh, Farm Viability blog, which is um, at blog.uvm.edu slash farm via, F-A-R-M-V-I-A. Um, you can call at 802-476-2003. Excellent. Well, Chris, I want to thank you very much for being on Across the Fence. And as always, I want to thank you for stopping by Across the Fence.